to one we are on air. Welcome today uh, in Batori Foundation. We will be discussing the topic of corruption and deterioration of rule of law in Europe. And uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Grzegorz Markowski and some welcome remarks from the organizer. Grzegorz. Yes, very, very shortly, uh, because I will be also uh, one of speakers. So just to remind me, today is uh, Anti-Corruption Day, International Anti-Corruption Day, and this event is uh, I don't know if it's a proper word to, to celebrate this day. We know that uh, there is no day without corruption, unfortunately, but still we have to remember it and fight corruption as, 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 as much as possible. And uh, that's for the beginning. I, I want to welcome our distinguished uh, prelegants, uh, professors, uh, civic activists, and I'm so happy that you joined us. Uh, I want to welcome our great moderator. Thank you, uh, Ola, you joined us. And, uh, and uh, last uh, but not least, uh, I want to thank at the very beginning to all who participated in organization of this event, to Carolina, Lech, uh, and uh, many other people uh, from our PR and, and, uh, and also to translators. and. Uh, just in advance, uh, we we are in uh, difficult times, so uh, please don't be confused too much. If if any technical problem will happen, we will be trying to solve it uh, as quick as possible. Thank you, and we can start. Okay, thank you, Grzegorz. Absolutely, uh, I think everyone uh, who is watching us and participants, we all know this is online. The time is difficult, and we will try to do it as best as we can. And I hope it will be uh, very interesting because the time for this kind of discussion is absolutely right, not only because today is the day of corruption, uh, corruption, anti-corruption day. Uh, let me start the, the meeting with a short intro, introduction of our distinguished panelist, our guests. So starting with Professor Kristina Arato. Is, uh, she is an associate professor and director at uh, ELTE University in Budapest. She is a president of Hungarian Political Science Association and her research interests are history and theory of European integration, civil and social di dialogue and European cohesion policy. She is a board member of Transparency International Hungary. Hello, Professor Kristina Arato. Good to have you. Uh, David Ondraczka is an expert of political financing and anti-corruption solutions. He is a member of Global Board of Transparency International. And for 13 years, he was a director of Transparency International in, in Czech Republic. Uh, good day to you, David. Um, Dr. Jonut Sibian, Executive Director of Civil Society Development Foundation, Romania. He is uh, extensive. Uh, um, he has extensive experience in working with European and international third sector and organizations. He is a civic leader, expert in field of uh, association foundation enabling environment of the third sector policy in Western Balkans. Uh, Dr. Sibian, hello. And last but not least, Dr. Grzegorz Markowski. Markowski uh, he's an expert of Batory Foundation and he used to lead responsible state program. He's a sociolo sociologist and a lecturer uh, in Warsaw School of Economics, expert in anti-corruption policy, civil society, and a third sector. He is also a publicist and the author. Hello, Grzegorz, good day. My name is Aleksandra Karasińska. I am editor in chief of Newsweek PL and managing editor of Forbes uh, Woman magazine. And I will have a pleasure to uh, run your discussion. And as you hear, uh, we uh, have some um, guests at home, but uh, don't mind it. Uh, let's start with the overview. Uh, and I will give you uh, around 10, 15 minutes of assessment of rule of law and corruption in each of respective country. And I would like to ask Professor Kristina Arato to start with your overview of situation in Hungary. Please, let's start with Hungary. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, start with sharing my screen. Please tell me if you can see my uh, my presentation. Yes, yes. we see okay. it. Okay. So um, actually, uh, I would like to um, to start with two things. Uh, first, um, I would, as you can see, um, I, I brought you today some, uh, some comparative data. I will mainly concentrate on Hungary, uh, but, uh, but we will have a chance to, uh, to do some comparisons. And, uh, and if my colleagues want to add something on the basis of, uh, uh, of these uh, charts and graphs that I show, we can turn back to this later. The second is that um, I'm going to uh, to share with you information uh, on the basis of uh, of several indices uh, for uh, for political scientists, sociologists. It is it is obvious that uh, that these data always have their limitations. Uh, there is a huge debate always whether a certain type of index uh we can is is valid uh whether we can trust it whether it's comprehensive enough to show a a, a a picture a real picture about corruption about the rule of law about the status of democracy and and uh, we have to admit that all of these indices have their strengths and weaknesses um we can we cannot grasp reality in its uh, in its uh, in, um, in its total totality or how to say it but uh, but what i like about these indices is uh, is um, there is the timeline they show because uh, because these these data these indices show certain trends and what i would like to share with you today is the trends that we see in terms of corruption uh, and the status of democracy and rule of law in my country, that is Hungary. So this first chart uh, that we see, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is in Hungarian, and this is from the uh, Transparency International uh, Corruption Perception uh, Index report in 2019. And uh, uh, probably my colleagues will also talk about the, uh, this corruption perception index, maybe as an introduction, uh, we, can, we can say very briefly uh, what it is. It is very difficult to measure corruption because obviously no one is willing to say that, yeah, I actually stole from a certain pub public procurement procedure this and that amount. So, uh, so uh, the way we get information about, uh, uh, about this field is the perception, how different decision makers in, uh, in businesses uh, and, uh, uh, and in, uh, in the general population feel about the, uh, the level of corruption. This, so this is a certain, uh, this, is, uh, this is why it is called a corruption perception index. Uh, so turning to this chart, uh, I would like to, as I have to talk about Hungary, I would like to draw your attention to the red line. So the data start in 2012 and, uh, and the decline is a decline. Uh, so the line you see uh, is, the, uh, is the, the worsening of the, uh, of the situation uh, in terms of corruption in Hungary or the worsening of the perception of the level of corruption in Hungary. Uh, actually, and we will, uh, I think we will turn back to, uh, to the role of the media, but it is, it is interesting to, uh, or it is, uh, I find it important to mention that there are several corruption cases that are, uh, that are explored also by, by the media, Direct36, Atlatso.hu, um, and several uh, investigative uh, uh, journalists. Uh, however, they are not introduced, even the most obvious cases are not introduced by the state media and the, uh, the different media platforms that are owned 
by uh, investors who are sort of government friendly uh, uh, in their nature. So uh, that's briefly about corruption, and I would like to uh, I, I would like to turn to uh, the level of democracy. Uh, democracy indices are also that nature, as I mentioned before, that uh, there are huge debates uh, whether democracy, the level of democracy is measurable or not. Uh, still, people are interested. So uh, whenever, for example, uh, the Freedom House uh, Nations in Transit report comes out, it is always uh, uh, it is always debated uh, in the media as well. So everyday people are interested uh, in the sort of level of democracy. And, uh, and this is also a, a regional uh, graph. It started actually at the, at the time uh, that the Nations in Transit uh, uh, reporting started. That's the first year in 2003. And it comes uh, uh, as far as 2019. And, uh, and Hungary is, is this line, uh, this uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of gray line. And, uh, and you can see the road Hungary took uh, in these uh, 16 years. Uh, it started as a consolidated democracy. And uh, as you see the rating here, uh, between five and seven, uh, we consider countries as consolidated democracies. Uh, four to five is semi-consolidated democracies. And below, uh, uh, below four, uh, it is a transitional or a hybrid regime. So uh, actually, uh, since last year, uh, hung Hungary belongs to uh, 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 sort of according to the uh, Freedom House Nations in Transit data, to hybrid regimes. And you can say that this is, this is only one measurement. Uh, but actually, I don't want to bore you with, uh, with more data. But actually, all uh, democracy measurements uh, show the same trends. Uh, I, this is my last chart. And this is showing uh, VDEM, that is a, a rather new but a huge database uh, run by uh, a wide range of scholars all over the world, we can say, but all over Europe for sure. And, uh, and we see kind of the same trend uh, in the case of Hungary. So there was a huge fallback, what we say, democracy backsliding uh, in my country in the last 16 years. So, um, so uh, the reasons, uh, uh, so the, uh, going in details about the reasons why, why this happened uh, would take uh, much more than the time frame I have. Uh, but, but obviously the current government uh, contributed a lot to this process. So the, uh, the change of the constitution, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, previously mentioned uh, media structure uh, that is um, that is supported by the regulation of the media and also certain ownership trends in the media. Um, and uh, we, we can name the, the cases that you already know uh, about academic freedom, uh, Central European University, research institutes of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, direct attacks uh, against civil society with regulation that was actually uh, annulled sort of uh, by the European Court of Justice. Actually, uh, the, uh, the law on higher education uh, was also uh, was ruled against uh, by, the, uh, by the European Court of Justice. Uh, but the damage is made and, uh, and uh, this is all what contributes to, uh, to this backsliding trend that actually the graphs show. We have to, uh, we have to also uh, be clear that, that the trend did not start only in 2010. Uh, so uh, 2008, 2009 was somehow the turning point that was still the previous government, uh, but, the, uh, but most, of the, uh, uh, most of the decline 
uh, as we can see, has happened after 2010. So I would stop here and I'm uh, ready to answer uh, questions if any anything occurs. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. That was uh, that was very interesting. Uh, you showed the worsening situation in Hungary, and all the data uh, that you presented shows the same negative trend. Maybe we will step next to uh, to the next panelist, David Ondraczka. Could you please uh, tell what? Uh, give us the overview in Czech Republic. What is the present situation so we better understand the context in your country? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> as I was introduced, I am uh, I'm with Transparency International. So I'm I was for 13 years head of Transparency International in Prague, but I'm also sitting at the global board of TI, which where I am basically the only European at the moment. Uh, so I'm looking at the whole regional trends and looking at it from this perspective. But how I understood my transparency role was not necessarily activist only, although there was an element of activism, but always rather be expert, sometimes be lobbyist when necessary, when we advocate for a lot of uh, anti-corruption reforms and le legislative reforms. But sometimes I felt like advisor. To, to governments and, and to politicians because like they were lost in their roles. They had no, no idea what to do and they turned desperately to, to experts to actually give them advice. All right, so, so the, why I'm saying this introduction is that basically I'm a veteran in this anti-corruption field. I look at it from, from the long-term perspective and trying to look at different trends. So let me offer you at the start couple of remarks which are more general for the whole region and then few remarks which are Czech specific, okay? So I think one, one general trend. I believe uh, uh, the system in our countries, uh, a system of rule of law is broken, right? We all know this, we all know it. And there is no competition if, if Orban is worse than Kaczynski or Fico is worse than, than, than Babish or anyone else. It's basically all uh, kind of, a, result in in the fact that there is a deterioration of the system and, and the checks and balances are highly undermined so that's one thing second thing we all live in <clears throat> in some kind of a post-communist system still right uh, you know our president havel you know the legend he basically said once that there is only one thing which is worse than communism and that's post-communism right and that's what we are facing at the moment i think even 31 years after revolutions after you know all these all these ch changes of regime and and you know we see that my my perspective is that of course like there are a lot of winners of this transformation and transition but there are a lot of losers right and that's what divides societies these days there's no black and white picture because like uh, a lot of people simply are uh, disappointed with the whole development okay third thing about issue is that we are not living in a vacuum, right? In isolated islands, we are. We have open economies. We live in a global, global, uh, global world, and it also means global, global, globality or or um, globalization of crime, right? So whenever we touch any kind of uh, investigations these days, uh, you see that it's a, it's a cross national, right? At, not only regionally but also like globally you see that organized crime is laundering money elsewhere and then the, the level of sophistication is simply amazing the level of enablers of of uh, of uh, money laundering tax havens uh, uh, these are really criminal networks which are working very efficiently just one example when we were investigating uh, corruption issues in czech or in prague uh, transit company which is the municipal company that is running subways and trams and buses 10 years ago uh, we actually found more than 100 offshore companies where they were laundering money all over the world from from this one municipal com company in the middle of nowhere in prague actually right so what i mean is basically that this level of sophistication is fascinating and this one on particular case is still running in in in, in court and third general and fourth general trend i would say we also have to understand that people are that there is a certain fatigue of anti-corruption of uh, uh, discussions about democracy and rule of law. People are simply exhausted. 
they were bombarded for so many years with new and new cases, with new and new uh, investigations. But they somehow, uh, I, I, my, my feeling is that a large part of society is simply fed up and they don't want to listen anymore. They want to hope some, they want to see some hope, some progress, some something positive. And that's what actually undermines us as activists. It undermines uh, uh, investigative journalists because they, they come up with an amazing story, a fascinating story, and nothing happens. No one cares these days, right? And they wonder how come, you know, you know, it's a, such a such a masterpiece, but simply people are, are exhausted. Okay, and now coming back to, to my country, Czech Republic. Okay, I think general trends are very similar, right? In, in Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, perhaps to some extent Romania. But there are some specific issues in, in the Czech perspective. One, in my view, was that we had for more than 20 years a very stable party system, right? Unlike many other countries around us. So we had basically one conservative, one social democrat, we had communists who were basically there, and plus one or, or, new, or another minor, minor party. And so the stability was quite positive in many respects, but also it brought they were stable, but pretty rotten, right? There was also like this clientelism, patronage. They were fighting against each other only verbally and publicly, but inside they had a lot of uh, uh, patronage networks and, and they all collaborated. So that changed in 2013, uh, where there was basically the political system uh, completely, there was an earthquake and it, it, it collapsed. New parties came, out, came came in, and it actually brought destroyed this stability. So that was one thing. Second thing, and I think it's uh, quite specific, or similar, but but what I believe people hoped in in eighty nine or ninety, they wanted to return to Europe, and they wanted to get rich as their neighbors in Austria, Germany, or whatever France, right? So they wanted uh, return to Europe and and prosperity, and I believe. To a large extent, we moved in this direction, right? We are part of the international community, EU, NATO, you name it. And also the living standards improved significantly. It's not far from perfect, of course, but of course, you know, we are catching up slowly, but we are catching up. But I believe the people are missing some kind of new horizon, what next, right? And that's why, uh, we face a lot of these artificial conflicts, sometimes cultural wars, ideological uh, return of ideological, ideological divides. And I believe that's, uh, that no one is bringing some positive, positive horizon uh, for that. And last comment, very actual. So what do we have now in the Czech Republic? We have Babish, right? And it's quite specific uh, uh, case. Uh, because that's a, that's a, what is now is now is maybe third or fourth richer, richest guy in the country, a guy who who was a ex ex communist secret police collaborator, guy who was actually whose wealth was generated very suspiciously, and you could you know if you would ask me ten years ago if such a guy can be prime minister and most popular politician, I would say you are completely crazy, right? It's impossible. But now he's running the running the country. He's winning elections. His party, despite all this chaos, is uh, still the most popular one. Uh, and uh, what it actually means, you know, so uh, the guy, you know, when, when he actually went to see Trump in, a, in an Oval Office uh, last year, I think, so Trump was very grumpy because, like, it was the first time when some head of the state actually who visited him there was richer than Trump himself, right? So that was quite quite a specific visit. But what I mean is like, we cannot even describe it in traditional conflict of interest terms because this guy is actually overtaking the, the country and it's a, it's a business project for him, right? So he is owning media, he is getting all subsidies. He, he, is a, he has a empire of 300 companies that, that are involved involved in basically every every sector of economy almost every sector of economy and uh, but he's democratically elected of course you know no one can question that and as long as people like like it we cannot we can hardly protest but but you know even berlusconi was uh, just a outsider in comparison right because like this guy is actually 
controlling the whole whole business at this particular moment. But but let me finish. But but of course, when you meet him, and I know him personally, and I I meet him not regularly, but you cannot but laugh at him, right? He's such so so you know he's so weak. He knows nothing about politics. He's completely incompetent. So it's not that smart political like uh, Orban who is who knows things. He's just a guy who is a completely you know. I think he never read a book in his life, right? So he's not even educated. But still, this kind of uh, charisma that uh, billionaires, billionaire will actually save save uh, the poor people is a fascinating idea that, that we still don't know how to grasp it. But of course, and last last sentence, what it is about alternatives, right? So uh, Babish, in our case, is winning because opposition is simply weak. That's the that's a simple equation, and if opposition will be available able to provide some alternative and, and competent leaders, then Babish will disappear and we will have something new. So this is what I what I think uh, as a as an introductory remark. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was uh, very interesting, especially the part about your meetings with uh, Prime Minister Babish. But what I'd like you to underline is your very interesting and st strong assessment. You said the system of the order of law is broken in the region. And here is where I want to uh, pass to the next person. Um, now it's time for Jonat Sibion and Romanian context. Do you agree that with this assessment that the whole order of law is broken also in Romania? Please uh, share us uh, your uh, point of view. In terms of Romania, I disagree. I think uh, also what it happened with the elections uh, um, this weekend, uh, I see a lot of opportunities in the results of Romanian elections. Of course, we could uh, be extremely uh, depressed when we see that uh, we have an extreme right party that appeared from nowhere, um, uh, gaining 9% of the seats. On the other side, uh, um, I think this is the result that uh, the mainstream political parties, they clean their lists. So the social uh, social democrats, the former communists, actually they took out from their uh, offer all the people that were against in the previous parliament, they were running the anti-justice uh, um, um, uh, uh, campaign for three years. So those people are not anymore uh, in the parliament, in the new parliament. And of course, they are begging uh, these uh, uh, movements, uh, nationalists, uh, in a way fascists. Uh, but it's a, it's a result of, uh, of uh, um, this process. Also, I think um, what uh, always we liked in Romania, it's the fact that we had coalition and uh, um, lately, because I think uh, neither Czech Republic uh, that uh, had such a strong uh, um, opposition during the communist time with uh, Havel and uh, this uh, uh, extremely high profile um, civic uh, uh, engaged people um, didn't uh, uh, manage, you know, during times when they have strong uh, um, majorities of some government. So I think this is one of the good things uh, that uh, uh, happened on uh, on Sunday in Romania, that will have a coalition with a slim majority composed of three parties. It's uh, the liberals together with a, a pure anti-corruption pro-rule of law group uh, with 15% that it's a, a United Save Romania a party, that uh, it's an emanation of civil society at the end of the day, and the Hungarian minority party. So so they should look for compromise, they should look for uh, um, uh, consistency in what they are doing. And I'm really happy that they don't have a majority to go forward with the plans of uh, uh, reforming the constitution. This is not the time to do this reform. People will not understand it. Yeah, it's We, we will have an economic crisis. I think it would have been a very dangerous uh, um, um, uh, let's say process, if we'll uh, start it at this moment with a big majority in the parliament, as they expected, and to, to, to do constitutional reforms. Now I'm uh, um, 
going back to my initial plan uh, about my structure of intervention, and uh, I would like to, to, to go a bit to the link between rule of law, anti-corruption and civil society. And I'll go back before enlargement. You know, there, is, there was a very funny um, uh, joke in 90s among the diplomats, uh, European diplomats in Bucharest that Romania will become one day a uh, European Union member. That was a a very good joke in the 90s. But then uh, we had the, the war in former Yugoslavia and the Lacan uh, uh, Council and Romania became with Bulgaria a candidate country. So um, civil society, we as an intermediary organization, we were administrating the, the FARE, the pre-accession fund, and we invested huge amount of money in uh, civil society in the area of uh, um, anti-corruption, campaigning, education, uh, rule of law. And those organizations um, had very young, talented people inside that they were also studying abroad. And, and a key moment of the negotiations before uh, entering into the EU, they were part of the negotiation team. And I was just talking now with Laura Stefan in order from Expert Forum that was a young 20 something uh, 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 professional working on this. And with um, a minister also coming from uh, at that time from a Helsinki committee organization in Romania, Monica uh, Makovei, and they always were very, very skeptical about uh, you know, uh, the maturity of Romanian politician and Romanian democracy. That way we accepted verification and the control mechanism. Um, that the Croats, for instance, that enter after us, they didn't, even people from civil society that didn't want it, want it because we were not trusting the, that they will stay on on a you know uh, on a path that uh, uh, will um, consolidate the uh, the Copenhagen criteria, and this is what what uh, uh, David was was mentioning. He you said man, uh, David that ten years ago you didn't believe that you wouldn't believe that Babich will go to power. We we'll always we always had the belief that. This is the this is us Romanians, you know. We always uh, are not satisfied and say it will be bad, and we should do something. So we always uh, uh, been let's say with with the pistol under our pillow, <laughs> from this point of view. And I think uh, this was uh, the key issue that civil society was prepared to give people in a key moment in the Minister of Justice in order to, to build this reform and then to monitor and make a huge scandal. I mean, we don't have any problem of going to Brussels and to the embassy and complain about the politician. While, you know, uh, from other countries, it's a issue of patriotism and so on. We don't have that, uh, that in Romania. So we are always acted in a very, uh, uh, um, very uh, early uh, stage. Um, and we had the verification and the control mechanism. We still have it. We don't know if we'll have a report or not. It's a dormant at the moment, but who knows when we'll need it. And why it was important, this mechanism? Actually, um, the, they cannot, the commission and the members, the, the council, to cut Romanian uh, uh, funds, like uh, structural funds, uh, because of, of the uh, uh, bad results in the mechanism but always was linked with it, you know? And it was very smart linked. I mean, when we started in 2012 to have uh, big issues uh, um, and we, we suspended, uh, the parliament suspended the president, immediately they have sent uh, uh, some uh, very good team of um, auditors to audit the system. And surprisingly, we got a grade that will not allow us to ask pre-funding or reimbursement of the fund and also to stop the, the, the funds for the um, um, uh, agricultural policy. So this impacted hugely, you know, the same it was in 2017, 2018 with the, with the Dragnea regime. So everything uh, slowed. Also, we are not in Schengen also because of, of, of this, but it's nothing in the mechanism saying that we, if we fail with a report, then uh, we'll not uh, uh, get the, the, uh, uh, the Schengen membership. But always these were like built as an ecosystem 
and with the rulings of Venice Commission against of certain issues that Romania have done, it was a package that convinced the public, you know, that uh, uh, um, the government they, doesn't deserve the, their their support, and uh, we didn't have the the cash. The government didn't have the cash in order to to pay uh, their um, um, their supporters. Um, now about a uh, um, few words about uh, what uh, uh, how we see uh, um, Hungary and Poland uh, in, in in Romania. It's true that in 2017, when the the government at that time of the socialists they came to power, we had uh, a lot of planes coming landing in Bucharest from Warsaw mainly, but also from from Hungary. Uh, in order to exchange the experience. And they wanted to, to copy the model, you know, to, to get against European Commission, uh, to, to, to try to, you know, to, 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 to follow uh, uh, your examples. But uh, the, the, the balance in power in Romania was different. We had a, a president that was uh, uh, strongly uh, supporting uh, um, the rule of law, the anti-corruption and the, um, um, uh, a, a good way of uh, working with uh, with Brussels. So this was the the, the president Johannes, and uh, with a lot of luck and a lot of involvement of citizens going. You remember in 13 of January. Um, 2017, they issued this ordinance in order to, to forgive <laughs> all the corrupt people in the parliament, in the party of corruption cases. So people went out and not just civic activists, it was people from uh, middle class working in big companies. So this bridges that we created civil society during time with the business sector and with the people working in business sector, it helped. So this was the coalition actually that stopped uh, 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 or uh, slowed the, the, the process in Romania. And my last words are about uh, uh, what's happening now, also before the election, what we see. This is also um, uh, uh, things that uh, uh, Laura Stefan from Expert Forum that is more skilled in this topic than myself uh, provided to me. It's uh, uh, important that uh, we, we think that the political nomination in administration will stop after these elections. And we hope also that the National uh, Department of Anti-Corruption will continue uh, the latest month uh, um, efforts in order to look for bribe related issues because lately they're looking only on this uh, abuse in function of uh, um, abuse of official function so uh, most of the cases were in this regard sometimes very political and in the in the in the court just 52 percent of these files they were successful so we are going back to to what the citizens then want you know less less corruption less bribe in the administration in the health system in the education and i think this is return to re normality in romania so i'm a bit uh, uh, optimistic about Romania and I think Romania at the moment is not uh, a part of, of the usual trend that uh, Professor Arato uh, uh, showed to us and I think if this government will succeed to to get on this path we'll see um, you know good developments for Romania at least uh, in in the next 12 to 24 uh, uh, months. Janu, thank you so much for this uh, more positive narration from uh, Romania. Um, I would like to underline what you said that uh, that is very interesting to hear, especially for Poland and, uh, and Hungary, that Romanian uh, uh, society, Romanian uh, politics already had for years the mechanism linking the rule of law with funding from EU. Uh, this is worth uh, to think about, especially in the context of what is going on in our countries right now. And now please, uh, Grzegorz Makowski from Poland, uh, please tell us what is going on in Poland in last uh, four or five years as far as uh, um, rule of law is concerned. Grzegorz. Yes, uh, hello, good uh, everyone again. Uh, uh, yeah, 
I, I hope you can hear me. First of all, I, I would like to thank uh, to Yonot. Uh, I'm really happy to hear that uh, there is some uh, light in the tunnel uh, and uh, the, the change in, uh, in Romania can be <clears throat> uh, also democratic and uh, I wish uh, you everything the best and, and again, good luck with this process. And uh, I would like to start my introductory um, uh, with my, my introduction with uh, uh, underlining uh, uh, what, what is corruption, and um, and um, uh, because it, it, it very often it's a it's a problem with with definition, and I, I I'm sure that. Uh, that I won't change by this uh, address uh, you know, the, the awareness of, of of the Polish society and and other people who are watching us from from other countries. But uh, let me say that corruption is not only a crime. That corruption. Uh, I really like the, the perspective that was brought uh, by Alina Munio Pipide, also from Romania, uh, some time ago. <coughs> uh, she brought the perspective of corruption as a as a form of particularism. Uh, the particularism uh, that is, and this grand corruption, this, uh, this particularism which is uh, embedded and growing at the top of, of elites, elites, uh, uh, political elites, uh, business elites, and, and these elites decide uh, that uh, distribution of, of uh, different goods, for example, access to public posts, uh, access to public money, grants, uh, uh, support, and so on, EU money, uh, is not uh, uh, delivered on uh, equal uh, norms and equal rules, but uh, it is delivered only or mainly on the, uh, in the logic of, of uh, political uh, loyalty, or party loyalty, and uh, and friendliness to uh, to the ruling party and government, and this uh, particular doesn't have to be illegal. Actually, it might be legal. It might be legalized, and uh, mm, we know from the history that this is not only our practice. It was practiced by uh, also Western countries. Just to remind you that before uh, 2000, uh, 1997. Uh, many developed European countries, Western countries, uh, had uh, law, uh, laws that uh, uh, made possible uh, to deduct, deduct bribes uh, paid for uh, to foreign officials from their uh, uh, from from their taxes. So it was an example of, of legalization of, of corruption in a way. It, was, uh, it is now finished by, by the OECD Convention on, on bribery of uh, foreign officials. But uh, unfortunately in Poland, and uh, I'm afraid in many of our countries and uh, countries of our region, but in Poland we have a totally opposite direction. I mean, the many many uh, regulations that uh, uh, the ruling party uh, for last recent five years uh, introduced in Poland were in fact a kind of legalization of, um, uh, of corruption. Just to give you an example, um, uh, the changes in the, in the rules uh, uh, in the laws related to public administration, civil service. Uh, where the open comp competition uh, the provisions were dropped, and uh, for the higher highest posts in the civil service, and uh, and in exchange we have only political party nominations. And now under under pandemic, we have already uh, on play uh, on the table the new bills that will even deepen this uh, uh, politics nomenclaturization of, of, of civil, civil service in, in Poland. But this is also, I mean, this legal, legalization of, of corruption uh, applies to what happened with uh, our judiciary, uh, with the independence of judiciary. And uh, I don't want to 
go too much into details, but I think in terms of, of grand corruption, in terms of um, of this link between corruption and uh, the rule of law, um, the changes that made uh, uh, possible uh, for politicians to influence uh, independence of uh, of, uh, of judges, uh, prosecutors, and the whole um, whole uh, law enforcement system in Poland uh, are a form of of particularity because uh, I mean this is not uh, done in in, uh, in the, on behalf of the public interest on behalf of the interest of, of civil society this is done in, on behalf of uh, of particular interest of the given uh, party and to secure the interest of the party and to uh, um, to uh, assure that uh, impunity will be also impossible. So, uh, so we have uh, um, in Poland uh, slower or faster, but very systematic and uh, continuous uh, and lasting for recent five years. Um, uh, the, the process of building of illiberal state, uh, of building, uh, uh, creating laws that are. Uh, uh, in, a, in fact, uh, uh, legalizing corruption or making ground for uh, for corruption, and this is done by mainly by the political elites, and this is probably the difference uh, to what is happening in, in Hungary and in, uh, in, in, in Czech Republic, that uh, at least uh, until now no business elites are involved in this process. I mean, uh, what is going on? Uh, here it's, it's mainly uh, uh, the, the, the result of, of actions of political elites. So uh, this is what is going on, and uh, we have uh, we have new developments. Uh, we have new ridiculous laws that are uh, implemented by uh, anti-pandemic uh, legislation. Uh, uh, I checked this with uh, Transparency International Secretariat recently, but just to give you an example. Uh, we already have uh, uh, provisions that uh, totally turned off uh, public procurement laws, that uh, uh, turned off uh, responsibility, disciplinary and criminal responsibility for um, uh, for abuses of power related to um, the purchases of, of the equipment and, and resources necessary to fight pandemic, and this is already in the law. So. And we already have cases where uh, where uh, billion, uh, millions of, of, of public money were wasted for uh, for purchases that uh, of, of the useless equipment. And and if this law will remain, it, I mean, the people responsible for these decisions will uh, will be uh, will remain uh, in, in impunity basically. So so pandemic. Uh, uh, even deepens this, uh, this uh, whole process, and just a few days ago, we witnessed in, in Poland the takeover of the big media company that was previously owned by uh, uh, by German group, and now it is uh, bought by uh, by the state-owned uh, oil uh, company. It's like a copy paste from from uh, from Russia, where the Gazprom uh, years ago bought uh, created the media uh, uh, media company and started uh, buying uh, private media in Russia and of course controlling them and making them um, uh, submissive to the um, um, uh, to Putin. So, uh, so unfortunately, in, in, in Poland, the situation develops uh, not so, not so positively. But uh, uh, going back a little bit to more uh, to what I said uh, at the beginning, and, uh, and to the definition of, of corruption, I just want to to present you um, three slides. I, I won't uh, speak about them um, uh, too long. But what is uh, fascinating for me, I, and at this moment, I would like also to ask uh, um, a question to all uh, my colleagues in the, in the panel. I mean, if this is a, if this is a, the same situation in your countries, but uh, <clears throat> uh, 
I mean, the, the, the paradox of grand corruption and this, uh, this particular argument, which is uh, con uh, concentrated at the top of, 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 um, of, of the political scene and, uh, and there, uh, is, uh, is, not, is not perceived uh, or noticed uh, by the majority of, of, of Poles. I mean, in this in this chart, you may see that uh, that the opinion about you know how big uh, corruption is in Poland um, uh, actually improves uh, for uh, uh, for last years and improves even even uh, during first uh, three years of of, of of the United Rights uh, um, camp. Uh, uh, and so people simply don't feel this uh, this grand corruption by themselves. This is what this uh, uh, chart says. Uh, another piece of this picture is that uh, people uh, not only don't feel it, uh, but they, I mean they 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 don't perceive corruption as a as an important uh, as an important problem. Uh, but also, they don't uh, uh, meet this in, in their experience. Of course, I am aware of all uh, or dysfunctionalities of this kind of questions that are uh, that are in, in public opinion pools. But still, I mean, even even knowing this, uh, you may see the trend. I mean, people have a better opinion. People have uh, less experience with corruption. And even in the, I mean, uh, Christina mentioned the um, Transparency International Perception, uh, the Corruption Perception Index. Even in the in the index, uh, this uh, drop in uh, in ranking because based on on index, uh, uh, Corrupt, uh, Transparency International builds also ranking every year. So our drop in in the ranking is not so uh, severe. And uh, our uh, uh, our score in in the index uh, is not falling as uh, radically as, as we could expect. I think we will see the uh, the bigger drop in the, in the coming uh, in the coming uh, corruption perception index, also because of the pandemic. But this also shows that the international community of uh, experts of those who comment situation in countries because these are these people who contribute to these indexes. This is not uh, these are not uh, public opinion polls. Uh, I think that they um, they are uh, let's say uh, distant a little bit and uh, maybe this is uh, lack of their knowledge about about the country. Maybe this is uh, something. And maybe they also don't see this this grand corruption that is growing for for the for years, but um, but um, I mean the, for me this explains uh, why uh, people still vote for uh, um, for the for the government for the parties, uh, which are I mean from the objective point of view I mean. Uh, Doing what they're doing. I mean, they're building corrupt states, and people don't react. I mean, because they don't feel it. I mean, the grand, the, para, the grand paradox of the grand corruption is that it is not uh, experienced as a close, uh, as a something close to the ordinary people until, and this is what can uh, what can change also uh, thanks to pandemic. I mean, uh, it's like curing cholera with. Uh, he for AIDS or something like this, but uh, if the crisis will continue, uh, pandemic crisis and the consequences, economic consequences will continue, then people will start uh, judging governments uh, also by the prism of, 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 of corruption. I mean, the pandemic doesn't have to, uh, it, it is, but it doesn't have to link directly with corruption. But if the uh, if the quality of life will will drop and the, the feeling that uh, in general uh, economy and and, uh, and the general situation in the country doesn't develop well and people start will start uh, also perceive uh, uh, governments as a as a corrupt and start seeing this 
this um, these processes that are now ongoing uh, at the top. Uh, I mean, this is this is my hypothesis, uh, but uh, just to to finish uh, to finish with one uh, one thought and uh, related to what David said that people are are bored with corruption. Uh, I mean, people. I agree to this, but this is not only the people. I mean, the the governments are bored. The international organizations are bored. And, um, I mean, corruption simply disappeared some couple of years ago from the global political agenda and from the agenda of, of many international organizations, also European Union. And I think that this is one of the reasons. And uh, maybe we should have, uh, again, someone like James Wolverson, I mean, the former uh, former uh, head of, of the World Bank, who started anti-corruption crusade in the 90s, in the late 90s in the World Bank. Someone, some leader of, of the topic from the international organization to bring it back as an important issue for, for democracy, for the rule of law, for, for all of us. Unfortunately, James Wolverson died, I think, on Monday. Uh, but uh, I mean, maybe a new leader will will develop soon, and uh, this will be some kind of another light in the tunnel for uh, for the countries where where corruption is uh, is becoming more and more. Okay, thank you, Grzegorz, for the overview from Poland. I just want to point out two things that you mentioned: uh, one, that corruption is not perceived by the society as a growing problem. And the second, you mentioned uh, worsening situation uh, in Polish media sector. And I hope we will have a chance to discuss more about these two uh, processes, these two topics uh, in future. But right now, I would like to ask Christina, because we have a question to you from our audience, from one of our uh, listeners, Evelina. She is asking you after your presentation. Uh, people in Hungary, uh, are they become more indifferent or just accepted the situation? Um, what would you uh, answer her quick, quite uh, quickly? Um, it, is, it is difficult to tell. Uh, it, um, it, it changes quite rapidly, actually. Uh, so after a scandalous week, I'm sure you had uh, that EP uh, uh, politician being caught in a uh, in, in a party uh, well not, let's not go into detail what kind of a party but it led to his resignation oh it's uh, interesting this, actually it's, a, it's very interesting party it's uh, a sex so, scandal yes, famous right? yes yes uh, but uh, but these uh, these um, uh, um, these events always sort of brush up interests toward politics and always, uh, uh, always uh, um, makes, uh, always, th these always make people um, sort of express uh, what they think about the government or the opposition parties. Uh, so, uh, so I would not say that people became uh, indifferent. I think we have, uh, we have a very deeply divided society. Uh, uh, the government has a core electorate uh, who are true believers. Uh, they truly identify uh, uh, with the government. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and I think the, the concept of identity that was mentioned before, uh, that is actually becoming more and more interesting all over the world in uh, identity politics has, has come back. And, uh, and this also explains how people can sort of explain events like that, how they fit to, uh, uh, to, to still accept to, to the idea of, the gov of their political preferences, but actually whatever side they are. Uh, so, so I wouldn't think they are, uh, that, that the people are, uh, are indifferent. I think in 2022, when we have the next elections, I think the turnout will be uh, will be high uh, if uh, if uh, things become things remain so uh, sort of divided as today, and there is no chance to a more uh, a cooperative way 
of doing politics from the side of government, I believe. Thank you, Christina, for this answer. And I will come back quickly to Grzegorz, because I would like to ask you, I know you have strong opinion about this, uh, about the connection between the rule of law, including free media, other basic democratic mechanisms, and the corruption. Uh, could you answer this very quickly to start the discussion? Well, to, to, to make it to make it short, I I will just I mean, what is what is the rule of law? I mean, the rule of law it's uh, it's a separation of powers, uh, checks and checks and balances. So it means that uh, uh, by the rule of law. Uh, um, we understand that there are different um, uh, um, um, powers in the country. Uh, we know all this uh, free, uh, free, uh, free parties, judiciary, uh, uh, parliaments, and uh, and executive power uh, and executive power, and. Uh, they have to be separated, they have to be autonomous, and they have to control themselves uh, simultaneously. And for this, they, uh, for, uh, for, and that, that's what, how, we, uh, how we are sure the checks and balances. When, there's, when this is destroyed, then we have the particulars, basically, because when, uh, when we concentrate power, uh, and usually this is the this is the executive executive power. We know all these processes from the history. Uh, this is how the the regimes authoritarian regimes were are always been. They, they, this is the executive executive power who takes power from other powers basically. And uh, so when we have this process, I mean, uh, referring to what I said about corruption, I mean, this is straight way to particular because with the concentra concentration. The, the authority, authority which is authoritarian, forgets about the citizens and starts to think only in terms of, of, uh, of its own interest. And, and so, just to give you an example, I mean, uh, what can happen with, with judiciary? And we already witnessed this in, in Poland. I mean, uh, uh, if, if the judges are controlled and if they, uh, if they. Uh, uh, make sentences that are against the interests of of, of of the ruling party, they are immediately uh, taken to the disciplinary proceedings. And even, uh, and this may relate even to the, let's say, uh, small cases like uh, participation in the process and uh, protests. Uh, for example, as you know, we have, uh, we have continuous protests against the uh, new uh, ab abortion uh, uh, restrictions that were decided by the, our so-called constitutional tribunal, and many people uh, already facing the, the, the uh, charges, and they are again uh, uh, behind the courts. And the judges that uh, that make decisions that they shouldn't punish, that make sentences that don't punish these people, are already under the pressure of. of uh, under the political pressure. And what it means in practice, I mean, it means in practice that your access to, to judiciary, to the rights, to the lawful, to the, um, uh, uh, to the, to the lawful and equal access, you, you are losing equal access to, to the court, basically. I mean, this is the form of, of particularism again. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you uh, Grzegorz, for the def definition. Uh, let's remember that in each of our countries, the, the worsening of situation started with so-called reform of the judiciary system, law, law system. Uh, right now, I would like to ask Kristina, uh, David, and Jonut, and then Grzegorz about the impact, the influence of uh, European institution, European Union institution, and what is this influence for in case of each bridge of the um, of the um, law and order in each country or corruption cases. How do you perceive the influence of European uh, Union on Hungary, uh, Kristina? Uh, thank you for the question. It is very uh, acute and, uh, and actually we are, uh, we are living in this sort of influence, whether it uh, uh, whether it makes sense, whether it's successful or not, uh, because at the moment, 
there is an ongoing debate between Poland and Hungary and the, uh, and the rest of the European Union member states. Uh, what, is, uh, what is on the agenda is uh, the multi-annual financial framework in the European Union. Uh, and the majority of the countries agree that uh, uh, EU benefits, so mainly structural funds, uh, have to be connected to rule of law principles. So the idea is that those EU member states where there is a problem with the respect of rule of law uh, should not be receiving uh, EU funds. Actually, it has a long story why and how this idea came about. Uh, because since, uh, since Orban got into power for the second time uh, in, in 2010, he had a government between 1998 and 2002, uh, still outside the, uh, the European Union during the accession process. Um, and uh, uh, so after 2010, in the case of Hungary, after 2015, in the case of Poland, uh, uh, quite a few um, remarks arri arrived uh, about whether rule of law is still respected in, in these countries. Uh, because Article 2 of the European Union lists uh, the values of the European Union uh, on which the, our cooperation is resting, which is rule of law, democracy, respect of human rights, and so on. So, uh, so actually, the EU had this uh, uh, article number seven uh, in the in the founding treaty uh, that says that actually the membership of a particular country can be suspended uh, if these principles are not respected. Uh, at the moment, Poland and Hungary is under Article Seven procedure. But it seems not to be working because it has been going on for a while. The European Commission initiated the process against Poland. The European Parliament initiated uh, Article 7 procedure uh, against Hungary. And it's still, it, it has actually two phases, but we are still uh, in phase one. And uh, um, it, was, uh, it was negotiated or uh, debated in the Parliament. It was on the agenda of the Council, uh, but actually there is no, uh, um, not, nothing came out of it so far. Um, looking at this, uh, there is another procedure uh, created in 2014 and that was initiated before Article 7 was initiated against Poland. So this commission procedure actually with uh, Dr. Makovsky, Makovsky, we were in correspondence because, because I was constantly asking him how he thinks this is going to work uh, in the case of Poland. And as he suggested, and after, he, after it turned out that actually the Polish government did not respond to, uh, uh, to the inquiries from the European Commission in the framework of this procedure. So actually now we are in, in, a, in, a, in a stage uh, when we want to do just another rule of law procedure, now connecting it to, um, uh, to uh, structural funds and the, and the budget of the European Union. Uh, whereas I think that uh, it is obviously one of the most important things to uh, uh, to expect from member states to respect the, uh, the common principles of the European Union. I have doubts whether this solution uh, is e efficient. So, um, first of all, uh, as we see, uh, we are facing problems of having it at all, because it is, uh, uh, it is being sort of avoided by uh, the Polish and Hungarian governments. And, uh, and uh, uh, just for, for the record, at the moment, the, uh, the European Union budget is going to be divided into two parts. We have the, uh, uh, the original budget, the multi-annual financial framework of the European Union, 
and we have a separate sort of COVID fund uh, that is going to be used uh, for for helping member states to get out of the financial and uh, and the economic crisis uh, that is being caused uh, by the pandemic, and and this fund uh, that for the first time in the history of the European Union includes international loans can be taken outside the European Union. So our two countries might not be needed for this. But uh, the multi-annual financial framework has to be uh, voted for by all the member states of the European Union. So and in, in that case, some kind of a, uh, uh, um, a, a conclusion have to be have to be found, some kind of a, uh, um, a kind of a cooperation. So this is why, and my, uh, and this was only the uh, sort of the summary of what of where we are now. But what I would suggest is uh, is to find different approaches, uh, to find approaches uh, in order to sort of keep these countries uh, in the world of uh, uh, of rule of law and uh, and uh, uh, and democracy. And this might be surprising, but I would say that the introduction of the euro have a kind of an unintended consequence of uh, keeping uh, rule of law, the level of rule of law and, and democracy, of course, not perfect, but, uh, but somewhat in a better shape than we have now. Because, uh, because uh, euro introduction requires um, uh, going into the European Public Prosecutor's Office, that is actually run by Laura Konduta Kovesi, who is from Romania. Um, uh, there is uh, uh, there are special procedures uh, within the European semester that is compulsory for Eurozone members. Uh, that uh, um, that includes. The, the permanent control of the independence of the of the judiciary that uh, Grzegorz was uh, was talking about before. So I would say probably other uh, uh, European Union tools might uh, other maybe more sort of technocratic tools might be more efficient uh, than uh, than politicizing. Uh, uh, this issue, and I'm I'm uh, I'm trying to return what I said before. I think uh, this debate is highly important. It is very important to make these countries speak out, say that we don't want a rule of law procedure. That's important, but we should not expect results from this. So this is why I think other solutions might be more helpful. I have another idea, but I don't want to uh, 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 take up the time for so long, uh, which is the control of spending EU structural funds. I think it could be done could, could be done much more efficiently than at the moment. I would actually uh, uh, publicize where I found uh, um, cases which projects were problematic from the public procurement uh, point of view, uh, because at the moment the European Commission is kind of uh, applying a, a very general approach. Uh, Hungary had a deduction last year of 10%. But I mean, it means that, uh, that we still can keep the money and, uh, and actually the uh, the problematic and uh, and illegal uh, public procurements uh, are are covered. Nobody knows about them. Nobody knows about the projects that were actually uh, uh, done uh, again uh, illegally or against the law. So uh, so I think uh, going sort of back to technocracy would be very useful uh in these cases especially uh, in the uh, if we talk about anti-corruption thank you sorry thank for you being thank so you long. no no that was super interesting christina but uh, i uh, i would like to david comment on that especially what you just said that you would like to 
use more control on EU spending because, uh, David, you mentioned your Prime Minister Babish and how rich he is. And we know that great uh, part of his wealth comes directly from EU founding. So what do you think about this, uh, how, how European Union is efficient or what kind of tools uh, it, it, as an organization it has to to this control, to, to, to apply this control uh, to, yeah. what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief, but like, let me make, make mainly two comments, one on EU funds and Babish, and one on EU influence, I would say on our countries and the rule of law, right? So my, my view is that like EU funds are perceived as a, free money you know as a kind of free meal that is coming somewhere from brussels and then that it's not actually our, that it's not our taxes right that it's coming from from somewhere above us and we can use it and this mentality and this sentiment was actually intentionally uh, proposed and it was understood by many but but by people who are you know even pretty honest right you know mayors and, and local politicians and some business people who didn't mean to steal it, but they understood that it's actually some mana which is coming from above us, and 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 then, you know, and we can use it. And of course, consequence is uh, that you have so many idiotic projects that have no use, that have no uh, no um, impact. But on the on the other hand, we have a lot of projects that actually improved our life, right? It improved the. Uh, quality of our infrastructure that helped our cities and, and, and municipalities. So that's that's one thing. And, and I believe it also has uh, is coming back with uh, or hand in hand with some kind of a anti brussels sentiment, which is again politically and intentionally developed to create the enemy, to create some uh, artificial bureaucrats sitting in Brussels. No one mentions that there is a European Council which is consisted on, of, of, of European governments that actually makes the decision, right? And which can veto any initiative and which can stop it or, or move it forward. Uh, well, on Babish particularly. So, as I mentioned, it's a very freaky case because like he is the biggest recipient of EU money in the country, right? Himself. So he understands uh, EU funds as a ATM, free ATM, where, which, where he can withdraw money to his own pocket, right? And it's fascinating because like his whole business empire and conglomerate is, is running on EU funds. And I, I became his biggest enemy because like I was the one who, with TI, we actually initiated procedure that basically said this money uh, he receives illegally because of the conflict of interest. That he stands as the head of the government, controls the whole administration, he is actually sitting at the European Council, at the European Council, to de decide about agricultural subsidies and all this conflict of interest. And we win basically after two years, right? But I was mentioned as a public enemy number one, and I get so much hate from his media and and his uh, his political uh, political group. You know, it was quite ugly at times. But what I mean is, now we are getting to the point that most probably. Uh, he will probably have to return all the money that he receives over the last couple of years. And we are talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of euros, right? So it's not um, one project here, one project there. We are talking about uh, hundreds of millions of euros. Well, and, uh, and this is where, in our case, this uh, state capture is most visible because, like, you know, if that would be a company or, or business empire that has no political backing then most probably institutions would immediately say, give, give money back and initiate the procedures. But now, because of this capturing of the state and his political status, he's kind of untouchable, right? And, and institutions actually cover it up and, and at least they are uh, trying to buy him a time. Well, and the second comment on, on EU influence. Um, well, you know, we all look uh, fascin in a fascinating way what happens now about this uh, new EU money package, right? That, and we wonder, is it possible that countries like Hungary and Poland would actually give up this money uh, because they would win some, some uh, uh, symbolic battle, I would say. But it would be very costly, right? And if it would be very costly for, for citizens and for the country as such. But 
At the same time, we know that uh, it's super sensitive for EU to actually impose these sanctions directly and say, well, as long as you don't destroy your judiciary and, and, and institutions, you know, we will cut you EU funds, right? That would be the only, uh, in my view, the only uh, mechanism that could actually work. Well, Ms. Jourova, who is a commissioner for transparency and rule of law, now she's my she's friend of mine, right? And I know her well, and she's in a very hot seat, right? Because like she she should actually enforce it. She should find some solution. But you know, she comes to if she comes to Budapest or Warsaw, so they slap her and they they send her home to Brussels, right? And say, well, go home, you know, you are not welcome. And it's a very tricky thing. Oh, to finish, my my feeling is that the rich countries that are basically funding EU and that are basically funding EU funds and, and all the schemes, like uh, like uh, Scandinavian countries or, or or Dutch or Germans, they will lose patience at some point, and they will not willing to be be uh, idiotic ATMs for our dictators or or our authoritarians, and I think that will actually force very high and very deep conflict which might which outcome might be unknown in my view uh, but i think they will say well we will either decide that we will not send you any more money because like we feel that, that you use it uh, for your own benefit and not for the country's benefit or we will somehow kick you out of the of the, of the squad you know that's what i always like see as a potential scenario but it will be definitely very, very hot, uh, hot political issue. Thanks. Thank you, David. You mentioned the money, but also um, we have to remember that uh, European Union is not only about common market and money, and not only about uh, also about values, but also about practical things like free trade, movement, movement of people, and also like common. Uh, standing against uh, different uh, problems like pandemia. We will have all of our countries the vaccine because the European Union took care to buy stocks of the uh, vaccine and help our societies get back to normal. So uh, taking all of this under consideration, I would like to go to Jonat, uh, Jonat and then to Grzegorz to, uh, to ask your perspective, uh, Romanian perspective on what is going on on this power play between Polish government and uh, Hungarian government and uh, European Union from your perspective. Was it successful to uphold the rule of law after all these years we, we were talking about, especially in Romania for years, the, the, the situation and Poland is going on for years. Yeah, and it was used in the elections in the previous elections in the uh, uh, elections for the parliament this was one of the main issue uh, election of the president that why it was that successful those two elections bringing you know a majority for the parties that uh, are attached to, to to those values not the last elections when uh, um, the uh, junior coalition member hopefully of the liberals uh, that it's a uh, uh, union of save Romania and plus those parties that are in the European Parliament uh, in the group uh, in the new uh, group renew Europe with Dacian Cholos the former prime minister uh, as head of the group they uh, try to pass in the parliament uh, a law forbidding you know people that are convicting uh, uh, are convicted uh, uh, on corruption cases to to run for for uh, office. Unfortunately, it really was not uh, successful. They tried to pass it in the last days uh, of election campaign. Um, so the topic is still uh, uh, on the table. I'm looking forward to see who is the minister of the new minister of justice. This will be a clear signal of uh, of uh, uh, how uh, um, uh, high will aim with uh, with the next government uh, on this issue. But coming back a bit at the European level, and again, always I'm, I, I like being a, my, my MBA, it's in history, <laughs> I'm trying to, to look a bit uh, uh, back in time. I mean, um, uh, look at the socialists in the parliament and look at the uh, APP 
in the parliament. It's a big difference. I mean, they threatened the Romanian socialists with exclusion from the very beginning. Uh, while APP, they tried, uh, you know, to um, negotiate with Orban, you know, and he won time, basically, nothing changed. Uh, uh, they didn't uh, uh, keep the red lines that they were aiming with, with, uh, with, uh, with Orban. And I think this was, uh, this was uh, um, devastating. While, for instance, in, uh, the socialists in the conference in Madrid, they asked Dragnea there and they told him what are the red lines red lines and they didn't uh, cross it after Madrid. So I think uh, also the way that the dynamic was uh, in the parliament with the groups helped or not, you know, uh, in the case of uh, Romania and Hungary. Well, with Poland is different because uh, anyway, the, the uh, um, ruling party, they are in this conservative movement that was uh, created by, uh, by the Brits uh, years uh, uh, before. Now about the uh, uh, um, technocrats, you know, I think uh, in terms of uh, Romania, when it was uh, those directorates uh, in charge with auditing uh, of EU funds in DG Regio or in, in DG um, employment or other DGs transport, they uh, empowered the people the the technocrats the you know the the bureaucrats to act against uh, against uh, Romania so well uh, I think in terms of Hungary and Poland they were more mild in in uh, in conducting their assessment assessments about uh, public procurement uh, about uh, uh, um, you know uh, failing to uh, um, uh, provide uh, the indicator so on so I think it was a I might say it was kind of double standard. In, in that, and then you see that, uh, you know, uh, um, they uh, learned the lesson that, uh, you know, um, the consequences are not as big as uh, we thought, uh, meaning, you know, stopping the, uh, the um, refunding of uh, uh, pre-financial, pre pre-funding and reimbursements of the fund, stopping the negotiation for the new funds, you know. So it was, uh, it was uh, uh, always, you know, uh, we'll go forward. Uh, and I think this was a, a, a big mistake that, uh, uh, that uh, was done, uh, um, I don't know, uh, years yeah, no. ago. Jana, do you think the European Union as an organization is learning on the mistakes? <laughs> yeah, but they had the had the case with with Romania, so this was a. I, I I was hoping that it was a lesson learned that you should act immediately, you know, and find a solution in order at the uh, technical level in order to to uh, to stop. Uh, uh, or uh, diminish the, the amounts that uh, are going to, to those governments because basically they're relying on, on this money. Without those money, you know, I think also their uh, support will, will uh, uh, diminish in the, in the countries that they rule. Because at okay. the end of the day, the Polish, uh, the Polish farmers, they are um, very, very uh, um, dependent, uh, yes. dependent on, on those money. What will happen in six months? They will not receive the the payments in in agriculture. We'll see then how how peace will uh, will uh, survive. Yeah, on, well, this is the question to Grzegorz. Speak, uh, Grzegorz, what will the farmers do without uh, European money? And is this scenario at all possible for you? For you? I, I don't want to focus on farmers, but uh, they already are expressing concern about what, what will happen and uh, they are already not so much satisfied how the money for agriculture are spent by, uh, by this government. But, so I expect that uh, if, if, uh, if this line of budgeting uh, uh, will disappear or will be uh, or this money will be more difficult to uh, to obtain, and I mean that there will be, a, of course, protests of, of pharma, farmers. But uh, I, I had an idea after you asked uh, Jonot uh, uh, about uh, to, to answer the, this question uh, that you asked. Uh, I had an idea. Uh, uh, 
related to your another question to Jonathan, and the question about if the U, U is learning. Uh, okay, so uh, in case of Poland, I think uh, uh, I don't want to talk about all this history and all these cases that we have uh, before uh, the European courts and other European institutions. I think that for now, the, the, the all measures that are uh, in hands of the European Union institutions uh, uh, to bring us back to, to the rule of law standards and to fight corruption um, are used. I mean, the question, the question is, I mean, how consequent they are used or, or not. And I agree with, with Jonut, what, what Jonut said. I mean, there is a problem with the consequences consequence of, of use of these tools and the, and the double standards. Uh, I totally agree that, uh, I mean, these tools could be used much stronger, uh, more consequent, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and for our good. I mean, it's not uh, what, uh, what our government tries to, to say to, to the Polish public opinion pool that there is uh, some fight between the Euro bureaucrats and, and Poland that we are fighting for sovereignty. I mean, for me, someone who is uh, very much, uh, uh, um, very much thinking in terms of, of, of liberal democracy and liberal institutions and uh, the separations of, of power, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's total absurd what, uh, what I hear from, from our government. And, and this whole discussion that we, we want money and we don't want the rule of law, it's, it's, it's like uh, from, from some science fiction uh, movie. But, uh, so I think that the, in general, I think that all tools that are, are um, uh, all instruments that European Union have, uh, has, uh, are now being used. And uh, the question is uh, how effective, how fast and how consequent. And, but going back to this question about uh, if the European Union learns from its mistakes, uh, I, I may say something that may, may sound controversial, but I think that taking account all uh, you know, loopholes in the European, uh, in the European laws and, and you know, all these uh, um, differences in, in standards, how different measures are applied, I, I think that for now, uh, paradoxically, European Union is probably uh, the most influential international organization in terms of fighting corruption and promoting the rule of law standards. Why I think like this? I mean, because I mean, we are quite close connected countries in the European Union and, uh, and uh, there might be very strong pressure comparing to other organizations like United Nations or OECD or other international organizations, there might be a lot, much more stronger pressure on the, uh, on the members of, of the European Union uh, uh, made comparing to these organizations. And also European, has, uh, European Union has its own neighborhood policies. And uh, I mean, they promote uh, these standards also to countries uh, in the neighborhood who want to cooperate with the European Union, like Ukraine, like Moldova, Moldova like uh, uh, other Aspire, uh, uh, Serbia. Uh, of course, again, the question is, I mean, how much they are conse consequent and, uh, and how, how effectively they promote these standards. But still, I mean, this is much, much stronger pressure than any other international organization has. And, uh, and European Union made a lot of big steps in the past, I mean, to get into this point. I mean, I mentioned this, uh, this case of, uh, rich uh, European Union countries in the past from 90s, which were, uh, which could uh, deduct from their taxes, uh, which gave the deductions from the taxes to, to their own companies, deductions coming from, from the bribes by, paid to uh, uh, foreign officials from outside the Europe, from outside the, the countries. That was the standard at that time in mid 90s, in late 90s still when the European Union joined the uh, OECD Convention uh, against the bribery of foreign, o foreign officials. 
I mean, many things has changed. I mean, the, the corruption, anti-corruption uh, 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 topics, I mean, became very important uh, in the European uh, policy. I mean, now we have uh, much, much stronger infrastructure in, in, infrastructure in the European Union that serves to uh, to promote rule of law and to fight corruption, all of uh, uh, European prosecutor's office, uh, uh, European audit office, and so on, so on. And we have all this uh, legal infrastructure that is that is on place. And again, of course, there's the question about the, the empowerment gap and the efficiency of all these tools. But it is, I mean, the European Union is learning. I mean, I think it learned also from the from the case of, of, of the mechanism, anti-corruption mechanism that was applied to Romania and Bulgaria uh, before the accession and after accession. And this condi conditionality that now, now uh, the European Union tries to, to apply to in the new circumstances, it's a kind of element of this whole process. And what, what I would like to see again uh, in the future, and where, where I think it's, 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 uh, uh, it's again uh, the, the light in the tunnel, is uh, I would like European Union to come back to, uh, to, to more comprehensive, more systematic thinking about, uh, about corruption. I would like to, uh, to come back to, uh, I would like to European Union to come back to um, to the point where there was a, it was 10 years ago, when there was the idea to create a comprehensive European anti-corruption policy. And a lot of effort was invested, a lot of money was devoted to this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the European Union departed from it, and now these uh, um, reactions of the European Union against corruption, against the Europe, uh, against the breaches, breaches of the rule of law standards, it's it's more reactionary, I would say, and it's something is going on. Then the European Union tries to um, more or less consequently uh, react to, to to what is happening. So what is lacking, in my opinion, it's a, it's a prioritization of these topics in the uh, pan-European pan-European pan policy. And I would like to have it back, uh, at least to the point uh, from 2011, 2010. And one more important thing I think is is, is to invest into civil society. I mean, uh, it's uh, now we have uh, maybe. I mean, we will see what will happen with the, with the European Union budget. But in the European Union budget, there is a very important program, not the biggest one, Rights and Values program, that will be. I mean the 1.6 billion uh, euros that is devoted for the civil society and the, and the actions that also uh, serve to control corruption, corruption to uh, for the free media for uh, for uh, promoting uh, standards of rule of law. Uh, I would like to see this program uh, working effectively and as much as possible at the national level, not at the international level. So I would like to see this money uh, going to the organizations that work in Poland, in Czech Republic, or in other any other countries directly. And I would like to uh, see their more involvement and more support for the for the civil uh, for the civil society in, in this respect. Uh, Gregor, so you call for anti-corruption agenda in Euro uh, European Union and international stage, and this is actually a very good point to to talk about the last issue uh, today. I mean, uh, I was hoping that we will devote the last 20 minutes we have to uh, think about uh, what are the rem remedies, what are the solutions to the problems you mentioned before, and I would like to ask Christina, David and Jonot and Grzegorz later to say a few words, what are your uh, ideas of uh, how to rebuild the democratic mechanism, how to so solve the problems that you mentioned, and uh, you mentioned civic society, media, international institution, maybe we could also look at the international uh, policy uh, broader sense, especially in United States, in the, in the light of uh, United States election. Christina, what are your thoughts about 
ways to go forward? Uh, well, uh, I, I can share you my uh, share with you my uh, sort of the way of thinking. I, I don't I don't have solutions uh, because uh, um, there is several there are several ideas internally inside uh, Hungary uh, whether we can expect help only from outside. You know. Uh, as the MANA, is, as David said, uh, is coming in the form of structural funds, is the solution to our internal political problems come from outside? So, uh, so first of all, uh, the opposition uh, has its task. So, uh, you know, there are political parties still. We have democracy problem. There is. Uh, uh, there is democracy backsliding, but still there are opposition parties uh, in this country who have a very difficult, uh, uh, difficult uh, task to do, to perform. Uh, of course, it is, uh, uh, it is a playing field that actually is a slope. Uh, so we know that it's hard, but, uh, but still it's the task of political parties to run elections and, uh, and stuff. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Um, uh, the other is, uh, um, I think uh, uh, the European Union does have a responsibility because it's uh, uh, on the financial side, I think uh, uh, economic basis and financial basis for uh, uh, at, at least uh, in Hungary uh, for this government, uh, is, uh, is coming from the European Union. And this is why the control uh, and the, the control mechanisms are so important because we know that, uh, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that there are several problems in terms of public procurement and they are, uh, 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 and uh, with public procurement, uh, these, uh, these resources are spent and we know uh, that uh, uh, the ownership of the companies who uh, who actually built up uh, incredible wealth uh, in the last ten years uh, actually are uh, in the circle around the government. So uh, the politics and economics uh, uh, do uh, uh, have a say to each other. Uh, so the European Union does have a responsibility in this respect uh, about upkeeping the rule of law. And, uh, and as I said, uh, the technocratic approach of control mechanisms and, uh, and maybe sort of wider mechanisms like uh, uh, calling these countries or uh, uh, helping these countries to, to join the Eurozone can be sort of a way out. If we go outside Europe, uh, as you suggested, the new American government, uh, I'm sure that um, uh, that uh, um, that the Biden administration will have more to say about these processes in our region than uh, than the Trump administration between 2016 and 2020. Um, uh, still. Uh, I think the number one task is for uh, the Hungarian opposition to uh, to provide opportunities uh, or or to uh, to provide programs uh, for the uh, uh, for the electorate to um, uh, to participate in elections and to uh, uh, to sort of provide an alternative because that's problematic because so far we only said what the opposition parties do not want after 2022. Uh, but, uh, but to have a program, why if they govern, uh, life will be different, uh, we, we heard very little. So uh, I think there is, a, uh, there is a lot to do. Thank you. Your, uh, sorry, thank you, Christina. David, your time, uh, we have like five minutes to sure. sum up the discussion and look for the solutions. Please uh, uh, share with us. Very briefly, let me 
Let me start with Slovakia, all right? We didn't talk here, but like what happened there was, there was a brutal murder of young journalist uh, two years ago. Then it actually erupted in street protests. Uh, basically, huge dissatisfaction with that time governing class. In elections, uh, finally won a guy who, who was completely, who played on, on, on anti-corruption ticket only. Nothing else, basically. The guy is actually nuts. His name is Matovic, but he's prime minister now. But what he did was uh, he basically freed hands for police and, and prosecutors. And what, what we see 10 years later, or 10 months later, part, sorry, 10 months later, is that they are going after criminals and, and corruption. They are, they are arresting heads of police, prosecutors, corrupt judges. They arrested last week the biggest uh, oligarch in the country, which is a big deal. And next line, next in line is Fico, former prime minister for the last 10 years. So guy like Orban, like Kaczynski, like Babich, right? So he might end up in jail very soon, I think. They all expect before Christmas, right? So what I mean is that once you open up and let them to investigate, it will be very difficult to actually uh, to tie them again. And, and so I hope that that's a one, one way forward. And of course, I don't have magic bullet either or magic wand either. You know, I believe we need really new generation of, of young political leaders who look at, uh, at the country, you know, who try to bridge these divisions, which are horrible, I know. Uh, but like, we, we cannot just ignore the other half of population and say they are idiots, you know, because they vote a similar way. We have to talk to them. We have to find a way how to approach try to understand what they really need and, and why they actually are so desperate and, and so dissatisfied. But of course, these young these leaders must be not only in politics, they must be also in civil society, in media, business leaders who actually try to say, well, we cannot actually give up on, on our countries, right? We are Central Europe or Central Eastern Europe. We are, it's a perfect place to live. We are quite safe from global perspective. And we cannot give up. So I, I believe in the younger nation in politics, but they have to be very smart and, and have to try to bridge these divisions which are enormous. Thank, thank you. you. David, thank you so much for mentioning uh, and remembering Jan Kuczak and Martina Kosnirova, who were killed uh, um, a couple of years, two years ago. We have to remember what happened in Slovakia, and this is also a part of political corruption problem. Uh, Janut, a uh, few words from you, from uh, your perspective on solving the problems. I know that uh, you have the positive uh, thinking towards the, the, the solutions. Please share with us. Yes, my colleagues, they just told me that I'm too optimistic, the ones that are following this discussion. So why I'm optimistic, you know, now in the end, it's also because the change of leadership in the US. I think it, we should follow very closely what will happen in Germany with the three front runners to replace Merkel next year. And uh, I think it will be very important uh, uh, to, to have there uh, um, a leader that will stand firmly against uh, these uh, uh, um, issues with uh, the values and the rule of law. I think it's very important what Rute was saying in the last council, asking the uh, uh, legal uh, team in the council why, uh, how we could kick out those people and re-establish European Union or something like that. So this is a, a signal that uh, um, already the people, uh, the, 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 the leaders, especially the Nordic countries are fed up with the, this uh, uh, behavior. And I think it will be uh, very important, the, the pressure inside uh, of uh, our countries from civil society, from opposition, from business leaders, you know, and keep this, uh, uh, this subject of rule of law and European values high on the agenda. I'm not that optimistic with the Euro, for instance, Romania, uh, we had Euro as, uh, you know, uh, um, to, to uh, uh, um, uh, get into the, into the club, but now there is no discussion about uh, uh, getting into the eurozone because uh, we are uh, failing to to uh, um, uh, uh, have the commitments to, to to get that the the rules and I don't know if Poland in Poland it's a debate as I know the, the Poles are very proud of their sloty maybe in terms of Hungary there is a, a debate but um, in terms of Romania and Poland I'm not that optimistic that 
euro uh, uh, zone uh, accession to eurozone could uh, uh, you know um i don't know empower uh, this uh, uh, coalition in order to 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 uh, stay firm um yeah so uh, thank you <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Janot. Grzegorz, uh, really, we are almost running out of time, but I really uh, want to hear from you and listen what are your solutions, except you mentioned uh, uh, more anti-corruption agenda from EU. Uh, what are the other possible solutions, also international? Okay, so very quickly, uh, and just to answer Janot, I mean, uh, of course, in Poland, Euro is totally out of debate since you can see it and as a, any measure, an anti-corruption measure or pro rule of law measure, because the lot is uh, sacred and it's, it's uh, one of the pillars of the sovereignty and sorry, forget it for, uh, for a longer time, I suppose. <coughs> so, so not this direction. Very quickly, I mean, uh, uh, of course, I'm international pressure in, in many ways. I'm coming from the EU, coming from other organ uh, international organizations. Next year, we have uh, uh, UN General Assembly on corruption, so this might be. And we didn't have this General Assembly for a couple of years, so this might be important uh, signal to the whole world, also to, to us, that, that corruption is, uh, and the rule of law are, are important. Of course, uh, I also expect that <coughs> that uh, the new U.S. administration will be more focused on, on this issue and more helpful, and uh, especially in terms of promoting the free speech, uh, free media, and uh, transparency. I, I would love to see uh, to see another initiative like uh, during Barack Obama was launched, the uh, Open Government Partner Partnership. So it would be great if, if the Biden's administration would uh, will come up come up with something like like this. Uh, so uh, so there are some uh, some uh, uh, positive elements uh, uh, globally, but. Uh, I mean, the, the real change, I think, must come from, from, from our societies, basically. I mean, uh, we still have a chance to have a free elections, maybe in three years in Poland, maybe maybe in a shorter time. But uh, we simply have to mobilize, not in, in terms of going to the streets, but I would love to see, like in Czech Republic or in Romania, uh, people on the streets protesting against corruption. We didn't have it for, for years. So, of course, I know that there are more important problems, let's say, but everything is linked. I mean, uh, the rule of law is linked with, with corruption, uh, and, uh, and the corruption makes, uh, produces inequalities, inequalities to access to, to different uh, public goods, uh, uh, institutions like courts, and, and, to, uh, and to, to execute our civic rights. So I, I hope that uh, we won't have uh, uh, assassinations like in, in Slovakia, and this this won't be uh, any motivation to to react uh, more strongly from the point of view of, to, of the society to, to what is going on. I hope that we put, people will start re learning that there is a link between the rule of law and corruption, and that makes uh, that has effect on on our daily lives. And I hope that we'll learn it uh, uh, sooner than later. Let's, let's hope so. Thank you, Grzegorz. Thank you. Uh, listen, we are uh, coming to a close. We are running out of time. Um, I would like to thank you again for your time and sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Professor Kristina Arato, David Andraczka, uh, Janusz Siblan, Grzegorz Markowski. Uh, my name is Aleksandra Karasińska. Thank you, Batory Foundation, for bringing us here together. And please stay safe, stay positive. Uh, I know Gregor would like to add something as an organizer to close this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am all, all also joining, uh, uh, and, and, and then I want to thank you all of you and you all for for moderation and just the organizational. Uh, announcements. Uh, we are not ending this conference. Tomorrow will be a session about uh, pandemic and corruption. 
again with uh, very interesting speakers, um, among others from the US. So I, I, I invite you and, uh, and, uh, and everyone uh, through internet to, to join us and, and also watch tomorrow's uh, webinar on this. Thank you very much and thank you, thanks to, big thanks to all who were involved to organize this, uh, this webinar. <clears throat> thank you, bye bye.